Christ. How many here believe that arts have the power to change the world? Look around, look around, keep those hands up high. How many believe that artists are powerful agents of change? So we're just very grateful to be here. Over the past few years, many have asked us why an artist-run organization advocates for new roles for artists in fields that don't seem to have any relationship to the arts. Well, we do it because we believe that artists actually have an increasingly important role in helping to solve some of America's most entrenched challenges in business and social innovation. However, the way that we think about artists must first be disrupted if artists are to realize their full potential. Art is about power. And throughout history, any place that you find totalitarian or oligarchical expansion in which few resources come to increasingly rest in the hands of fewer and fewer people, there you also have always found artists. Tiananmen Square, Arab Spring, Occupy Wall Street, Black Lives Matter. Art is a creative political expression and people who make art have a voice. The artist, the human, is the activator, not the commodity that the artist produces. Artists are creative disruptors with the power to transform systems and markets and companies. We divine new solutions that many others just can't see. But not, art is not only about power. In the 21st century, we, we must also recognize that art is most certainly about money, but it is still also about meaning. In my presentation today, we're not going to talk about art. We're going to talk about artists, the humans that produce the art, the human resources behind the industry. And together, we're going to explore some of the political and economic realities for many artists and highlight a few ways that artists are already working toward, across sectors as full participants in sustainable capitalism. So if we're going to talk about money, let's start at the grand slam of money. Just a few weeks ago, world leaders, CEOs, and intellectuals made their annual trek to Davos for the World Economic Forum. From China's economic turmoil to the global terrorist threat to new disruptive technologies, they certainly have a lot to talk about, wrote Xavier de Sousa Briggs, Vice President of Economic Opportunity and Markets for the Ford Foundation. But he cautioned, when the talk inevitably returns to the growing gap between the haves and the have-nots, participants should avoid falling into yesterday's discussions about inequality. At places like Davos, discussions of inequality tend to focus on how large the gap is, how wide disparities have grown, and how extreme inequality hurts those at the bottom. And this makes the idea of inequality very one-dimensional. Something that the world's most influential people come to see as a problem, but not one that really impacts them. The truth is that inequality saps demand and reduces productivity and reduces competitiveness of companies and nations. For all the talk about inequality, we are still very much in the learning stages of operating our businesses in America, let alone our entire economy, in line with our highest social values. And while the private sector has a central role to play in tackling inequality and creating inclusive economies, the sector cannot do it alone. Workers, consumers, civil society, governments all have roles to play. And to this list, let us today add artist. It is time for leaders across sectors to be, think about finding new ways to engage with the techies, the research scientists, and the artists, the creative disruptors of our society. Artists throughout history have remarked on the bliss that accompanies a great creative insight. Einstein described his realization of the theory of general relativity as the happiest moment in his life. Perhaps more poetically, Virginia Woolf once opined that how odd the creative power that brings the whole universe at once to order. Today, however, creativity and its value, at least in America, must be understood in the context of capitalism. And perhaps no artist of the last 50 years is more closely associated with the capitalist impulse than Andy Warhol. He once said, making money is art, working is art, and good business, he said, is the best start. Warhol was a skilled social networker long before there was a social network. 
He parlayed his fame into a personal brand around the world in part because he gave people hope. Hope that they would be famous if only for 15 minutes. If anyone in this room questions or has ever thought that artists are disconnected from the world and don't understand what's going on, consider Warhol and the number of selfies that have been taken today alone inside this building. You see, Warhol understood human motivation. And so when we speak of innovation, many miss one very important fact. Innovation is not just a design issue and it's not just a technology issue. It is a human behavior issue. And this is where artists excel. But before we go forward, let's go back. Let's go back thousands and thousands of years when a grandmother and her great, great, great granddaughter could expect to live more or less the same lives. Entire generations lived in physical proximity to where they were born. Human development was local and linear. But in my lifetime alone, let's look at what has happened due to technology. Technology has gone from something that was primarily for, for academics to something that many of us now fully integrate into our daily lives. In just a few years, we have come to live in a digital world and distance between people has disappeared. Digital change is at such an exponential rate that today a mother and her daughter will likely live a radically different life. You see, we no longer live in a linear world. Our world is an exponential and global one. To illustrate this point, I will borrow an example from Peter Diamandis of Singularity University. He calls it the new Kodak moment. In 1996, Kodak had a market cap of $28 billion and 140,000 employees worldwide. 1996 was also the same year that they turned down full-scale development of the digital camera. By 2012, Kodak was bankrupt with less than 17,000 employees and in that same year, Instagram with only 13 employees had a market cap of $1 billion when it was acquired by Facebook. Today, entire industries like manufacturing, healthcare, and finance are being disrupted by very small startup companies that are not part of the system. But what happens after the disruption phase? What happens after all the disruptive products themselves dematerialize? Consider this. Google's largest marketplace right now in the world is Africa. In 2010, there were two billion of us connected online. By 2020, five billion of us will be connected online. That is three billion new creative minds, most from a non-westernized point of view, with the same access to artificial intelligence and technology that you and I have in our hands today. And in 1995, that trillion dollars of computational power that you find most of us have in our pockets was the same amount that the US government had in the mid-90s. As technology becomes ubiquitous and our world becomes increasingly digital, the only differentiating factor, I believe, is how people will use the technology that is available. So business success resides in the ability to think creatively about the future, but very few CEOs are going to tell you that their companies are good at creativity. And this makes sense to me because business is still mostly a linear process and creativity is not. But you see, this is where artists excel. The artist Mel Chen defines art as a catalytic force that allows new options to become visible. The artistic process is an intuitive process guided by human motivation. The artist, the activator, is the activator, not the commodity that is produced by the artist. Marcel Duchamp changed everything in art when he conceptualized the work Fountain. In one work, Duchamp transformed artists from craft people who made things into thinkers who could transform things. One of his lessons to us is this. If you redefine and expand the definition of artist, you change the work of art. Duchamp used his process to co-opt an entire manufacturing industry and simultaneously disrupted long-standing artistic institutions that had been around for a very long time. He became, as Mel Chin referred to, a catalytic force 
that allowed new options to become visible. This is no surprise because this is what artists do. In his book, Lichpin, author and innovator Seth Godin wrote, our society is struggling because during times of change, the very last people you need on your team are well-paid bureaucrats. You see, the compliant, ma the compliant masses, they don't help so much when you don't know what to do next. What we need are original thinkers, provocateurs, and people who care. Every organization, he writes, needs a linchpin, one person that can bring it all together and make a difference. Some organizations haven't realized it, but they need an artist. People with a genius for finding a new answer, a new connection, a new way of getting things done. So this begs the question, how are we educating artists in the 21st century? For the past 75 years, the American education system operates in much the same way that it was first designed to, to support an industrial economy, seeking to train people to become cogs in an, in an industrial machine, subspecialized, eliminating variants. In the past couple of years, a group called BFA MFA PhD has generated a lot of debate and controversy around the subject of artist education with their report, Artist Report Back. It asked the question, what is the work of art in the age of a $120,000 art degree? We heard Titus talk a little bit about that this morning. And personally, I would reframe the question to ask what is the work of the artist in the modern age? BFA, MFA, PhD is often dis dismissed by deans, faculty members, and artists alike as a vocational argument for art. They claim that the group is trying to assess the value of art arising from measurable impact rather than from the value of art that is intrinsic as a public good. But I personally think this is not the more important distinction we should be talking about. But even if it is art as a public good, I will put to you, then we should be paying artists the same salaries in healthcare, that we also play other public workers who provide a public good. It gets better. Here are some of the group's controversial findings, but I want to share them with you because they speak loudly to something that I've been thinking a lot about over the last three years. Of artist graduates of the United States who reported visual and performing arts as their degrees, only 7% earn their living as a working artist. 24% are educators, 17 work in sales, 11 in service jobs, 10 in various professional fields, and 10% haven't worked in the last five years. 8% are managers, eight, 4 in medicine, 3 in business and finance three in blue-collar occupations, and three in other fields. How should we view this data? Well, I'll give you my take on it. According to this data, artists are already everywhere in every sector of our economy. All we need to do is put intentionality to finding new ways for them to activate and use their skills in their chosen fields. The world economy is calling for integrative macroscopic thinkers and for those artists willing to combine their unique knowledge and skill sets and cross sectors. That's a very important point. There is great opportunity. Our work at Ideas X Lab over the last three years has led us to believe this unequivocally and that opportunity is growing. In the past 25 years, we have moved from an information economy to a knowledge economy and now we are moving into a human economy as described by the Harvard Business View this way. People will still bring to their work essential traits that can't be and won't be programmed into software like creativity, passion, character, and collaborative spirit. Their humanity, in other words. The ability to leverage these strengths will be the source of one organization's superiority over another in the years to come." Close quote. This presents a substantial opening for artists but how do we make this happen? Well, there are no easy answers, but here are a few things that we have been thinking about very hard over the last few years, and that must be addressed. A different training and education model for artists is needed. The current prevailing model of educating artists probably can't get the job done because higher education systems are financially incentivized to keep current operations largely in place. 
Second, we must form complex relationships with industry. And this is not just a matter of deploying design thinking and turning artists into designers. There are already a lot of those in the market. We need sustained open partnerships and action research to create a radical new career path for artists in industry. Artists deploying creative intelligence, not just another group who deploys design thinking. And lastly, new models of arts philanthropy are needed to support innovation. Current models do not, by and large, provide access to funds for artists of color, or do they foster impact investing in artist innovation at the ground level where diversity and diversive thinking flourish? Innovation depends on these two things. New business models will provide financial access and, dependence and independence for artists, but I agree that what most of you all are thinking, it will prove disruptive for some. It's not going to be easy, but it is already throughout the country in small and big ways underway. Ultimately, here's the lesson from startup business to the arts world and education and philanthropy establishment. If you are not going to disrupt yourself, someone else will. Technology has provided democratizing tools that are bringing with them new promise for both artists and society at large and using the tools of the age in disruptive ways to change society is an area that has well been trodden by artists for hundreds if not thousands of years. So today how we as artists will choose to relate to power and how will we choose to relate to money and meaning? Let us begin to understand that our role as artists in, in a, understand our role as artists in a way that encompasses both the past and the future simultaneously. Let us recognize that there currently exists a call to explore the interrelatedness of our society in new ways and realize that our value as artists lies not in those objects that we produce, but even more so in who we are, how we work, and most importantly, why we do it. Our value is both a mirror of reflection and a hammer to shape new realities into the world in which we live. Here's just a few examples of what IDEAS has been working on for the last few years. We have integrated into a global NGO in workforce development that works with at-risk young people ages 16 to 25. And in the last year alone, we've helped to create 25 new pre-apprentice jobs for young people in a vocational education model by putting together an environmental arts or environmental core and a culinary program. We have taken the oldest uh, crime spot in our neighborhood that we live in, Smoketown, and it is now a community arts center for kids and that teaches science, technology, engineering, and math by using art as a tool. The community we live in also has the math and science magnet for the city of Louisville, Mazique Middle School. Kids from all over the city come to our neighborhood to learn. However, if you are a middle schooler that goes to Mazique in our neighborhood, you do not take the same classes as people that come from the other parts of the community. Artists are evening the equation. This is artist Sarah Lyons. She's also a motorbike mechanic. She put together an intergenerational mechanics training program for women in our neighborhood. And over the six, course of six months, they built a motorbike from the ground up, parts apart, to riding it out, and while they shared stories of what it meant to be a woman in the modern age. We have a partnership with Yale China, and every year, artists from Hong Kong and uh, the mainland come to Smoketown to share their work with the kids in our neighborhood. This type of cultural exchange is both an exchange of ideas, but even more importantly, it is expanding the network and the importance of our neighborhood across the world. We have a partnership with the Palace of Versailles and the Potager du Roi, which is the King's Kitchen Garden that was started by Louis XIV to grow more fruit and vegetables to feed a, uh, a larger group of people on a smaller plot of land. Sounds an awful lot like urban farming today. We send about four to six students every year over to the palace to do arts and agriculture apprenticeships. And this is also the French National Landscape Architecture School. The graduates from there come back to our community and do projects with us. This is now a rolling process that has no end and no beginning. It is not linear. Smoketown Arts Festival. This is a 150-year-old community that we are based in, Smoketown. 
It's the oldest African-American community in the city of Louisville. In order to do the work that we do, it is very, very important for us to completely honor and be immersed in and understand our, our allies and neighbors in the community. Zephyr Mae Miller created these fashions out of plastic bags that you see. These plastic bags are all that she had available to her, but her creativity flourished, and this is her family that was highlighted during the Arts Festival. We recruited the Curator of Roses from the Brooklyn Botanical Garden to move to Louisville, and she helped us to develop a commercial flower farm on the Smoketown campus. In addition to improving the aesthetics of our community, we also added a flower arranging course with it. We now have contracts with many of the event planners in the city of Louisville, so this, the flower arrangements that end up on people's tables at some of these events very well could come from our neighborhood. The Federal Reserve recently profiled our work in the Creative Innovation Zone. In order to launch this work, there was a, uh, uh, the original housing, federal housing development that was built in this neighborhood was built in 1940. When this work launched, that was completely torn down. Imagine the optics, if you will, of about a 20 block area completely raised where about 600 families had been displaced in the oldest African American community in our city. In order to start this work, we recruited poets, DJs, and dancers from the community and developed the Smoketown Poetry Opera to tell the 150 year history of this resilient neighborhood to honor our work. This group, then the following year, has become their own company, receiving an Art Place America grant for almost $300,000, and Hannah is also a member of that group. Our work with General Electric in our corporate innovation section places artists inside of GE in their manufacturing area to help innovate on appliances. And recently, this year, it was named a top partnership, uh, top 10 partnership in the nation between business and arts by Americans for the Arts. Diabetes is a very hard thing to talk about for a lot of people. And so when we were working with a healthcare business accelerator who had a new food scoring app, we brought in social media artist Man Bartlett. We set up an arrangement for him to take over our local media's Twitter feed, and he opened up an entire conversation in one day citywide around the subject of diabetes. And then finally, what's led us to our work that I'm going to tell you about last today is our work with Humana and the Clinton Foundation in Natchez, Mississippi. It was their bold goal initiative to help Natchez improve health outcomes in the city by 20% by the year 2020. When we were down there for this work, there was a lady that pulled me over to the side one day. And she said to me this. She said, you guys seem like very nice people, but this is not going to work. She said, what these corporate guys have got to understand, telling us to eat a piece of kale and walk around the neighborhood a couple more times is not going to catalyze change in healthcare. I've got a recipe card, she said, in my, in my kitchen at home. And it's in my great grandmother's handwriting. And it's stained and it's smudged. And the first ingredient in it is five cups of lard. But every time I make that recipe, and I smell that smell, and I taste that taste, I'm connecting to myself. So if you want to catalyze change in healthcare, it cannot be just about one thing. It's got to be about everything. This is something that artists understand, and this is how we work in our paradigms every single day. These examples are a few of the ways that we've created shared value between corporations and communities. We came to the conclusion through this work that healthcare is the best place for us to start and to focus on over the next many, many years, creating shared value and using artists in this way. We came to this conclusion because nearly $3 trillion are spent annually in healthcare, productivity losses to employers on employee health are over $250 billion. Starbucks spends more on health care than it does on coffee. GM spends more on health care than it does on steel. If we work to create shared value centered around health equity, we have the potential to create new roles for artists in our economy. As an artist and a former health care executive, I know firsthand that artists have an important role to play in transforming this industry. Ideas X Lab was created specifically to answer this call. The community we're working, again, uh, working in again is Smoketown. If you are born and live in Smoketown, your life expectancy is 69 years old, the same as if you were born and live in Iraq. 
It's number one in mortality rates and diabetes in the city of Louisville, and it's number one, two, or three across every major disease category, with the exception of suicide. Pretty harsh statistics, huh? This is the edge of Smoketown, Broadway. On this side of Broadway sits the largest concentration of hospital health and physician services anywhere in the state of Kentucky. No less than six hospitals, all of our major physician groups are 50 feet away. So clearly when we talk about access, it is more than geography. So how can we change this? What role do artists have to play? Well, I think we must first reframe the challenge. I don't think being healthy is most people's goal. I think people have things in life that are meaningful to them that they want to do. And being healthy helps them achieve those things or it holds them back. You see, as we heard earlier, our healthcare system is not a health care system, it's a sick care system which responds with clinical or pharmaceutical solutions when people are sick or likely to become sick rather than helping communities be healthy. The Affordable Care Act has financially incentivized industry to focus on wellness as a policy, but in healthcare, but healthcare's fundamental problems will not be addressed by just new policies alone. New grassroots politics and practices that expands our understanding of what creates a healthy community are needed. And most importantly, we need to fully recognize that we have structural racism and bias against poverty in healthcare, as we do in many ways in institutional art. We have turned poor health into personal failure many times in this country. And to some degree, we are assigning shame to poor health. But you see, our work is predicated on the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation's county health model and that model tells us that where we are born and live has more to do with our life expectancy than any other factor. IDISX Lab and a myriad of partners are currently working on a new model for integrating artists into healthcare that creates a shared value around health equity. It's not just the morally right thing to do, but it's also the right thing to do because I believe that we'll be able to show that it is good business. Health is the democratizing lens that connects people, policy, and private industry together. And My Healthy Days has three objectives. Using integrating arts leadership at the policy level. We'll use arts-based experiential learning to help healthcare industry, executives, and policymakers better understand what well-being means and how it is created at the neighborhood level. We'll use a hyper-local hyper approach to health equity and we'll train artists as a new breed of health worker to support communities in creating and implementing their own plans on their own priorities for alleviating health disparities. And lastly, we'll develop a franchise model with a toolkit and a measurement tool and a digital platform that uses arts-based approaches for improved community and population health. Last week, we announced that this program has been given a health impact project planning grant from the Pew Charitable Trust and the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation that will pro provide some serious scientific rigor to create a strong foundation of measurement to accompany this artist-led long-term initiative. Our theory of change is that health is social. In every community, rest informal and formal social networks based upon how people live, work, worship, learn, and play. We believe this is where health is created, not in the doctor's office. Our program will activate these networks. We will identify community artists in all of them who will help us understand the health priorities in their network. We will create opportunities based on the Robert Wood Johnson model and partner those partner artists who have MFAs and BFAs and work experience on top of that. We'll bring in national artists to develop long-term projects that can begin to ad addressing structural change in the healthcare system nationwide. Ultimately, we will use all of this qualitative data created by artists, marry it with healthcare industry quantitative data and health equity data from the Center for Health Equity and bring those two things together in what we hope will be a new model for healthcare in America that is artist-led and community-focused. My Healthy Disease is designed to provide new roles for artists 
in helping to move the relationship bet from corporation, between corporations and communities from generosity to justice. Working toward a more equitable and just city is good for people and I believe that we will be able to show it is also good for the economy. Building a strong economy requires a healthy workforce. A healthy f workforce requires equity and access at every level, education, jobs, and policy. And that's regardless of race, class, gender, age, or sexual orientation. We can no longer gra simply grapple with what is happening in the world, but we also must grapple with the how and the why. And this is where I believe artists, humanists, have a distinct role to play in working across sectors and shaping the future from the grassroots up and from the policy level down simultaneously. This will be good for communities, it will be good for corporations, and it will be good for artists. So today let us resign, resign ourselves to eliminating this notion of the starving artist because artists are powerful change makers. Artists synthesize our world and show it back to us in new ways. We are the storytellers of this tribe called human. And we are now all across this country in small and big ways beginning to turn our attention to becoming partners with some of the, to face head on some of the biggest challenges that our society faces in the 21st century. Thank you very much for having us here today. And I appreciate your time and attention. Wow. I think Theo has really helped us reimagine the future of healthcare. At least, this, you know, you've planted a seed or a few seeds here today, let me tell you. Um, thank you, Theo. I'm, and thank you again to Cigna Foundation for allowing us to, making it possible for Ideas X Lab to be here. And I really hope that you guys all connect with Ideas X Lab. You know, we don't have to, it's not, of course it's about Connecticut, but as artists and arts leaders, it's about how we're connected globally. And Theo has just shown us and, you know, talked about some of that work that he's doing internationally. I think you guys have a lot of opportunity. Those of you have already, some of you already do, but this is a, another great um, opportunity for you to connect with folks that are doing work that we think is important in other parts of the country. So Theo, brilliant.